Ricky Baker, now you are 13 years old. You are a teenager and you're as good as gold. Now this is your fourth feature film, and the previous three films, they were based on original ideas. You just essentially made those up. Yeah. But uh, this was the first where you've actually adapted someone else's material. When writing the screenplay, did, um, was, did you find this to be more or less difficult? I wrote the first draft of this in 2005, and um, I hadn't made any other features before then, and I found it really difficult adapting the book because I thought I'd never adapted anything, and I thought they to be super true to the material, and you know, and I was like, oh, how do I make, basically lift everything from the book and put it into a movie, and then I, I went off and, um, actually I, I put that to the side to concentrate on some other stuff, and went and made three other features, and then coming back to the material, realized, oh, you don't have to do that at all, you can just do whatever you want, and just take the moment, the parts of the book, you put it through your filter, you know, and, um, and, and you can never really capture the book properly. I mean, so they're completely different mediums. You can't, you know, a book is so long and the character development is, you know, it's, it's impossible to do all of that in a film. So I just decided to take all the parts that I wanted to see on screen and all the parts that I thought would be good and entertaining. And I, I chose the tone that I wanted as well. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna, you know, the book is not, um, it's not like a big adventure comedy. It's not even a comedy. and. I decided that I was going to make a comedy that was like an adventure film in the kind of vein of you know the ones that I'd grown up with and you know great New Zealand films and so I'd sort of chosen stylistically and, and tonally what I wanted to do and then took the parts of the book that I felt would would work in, you know, in, in the film I wanted to make and then made up the rest. It kind of sounded like um, after banking this and making three films that you kind of started to get used or even like the sound of your own voice or knowing what uh, you're yeah. able to achieve. Yeah, well that's, the same thing happened with Boy. I wrote Boy before I wrote Eagle vs Shark and I didn't feel it was ready so I put it aside and forgot about it when I made Eagle vs Shark and then two years later took the Boy script out and reread it and I knew exactly what I wanted to do that was different and you know again it was a tonal change and um, I actually feel like those are the the strongest ideas are the ones that take time for, with me. Hmm. Uh, now you're really good with directing kids, and I hate kids. So yeah, how would you I, teach? I hate kids as well. Oh, you hate kids as well? Yeah, yeah. I well, love my kids. I don't love other people's kids. Well, what's your secret? How do you like um, uh, direct hateful kids? I love. I mean, I love children. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's the most. It's not. It's just. It's just not the easiest job directing them you know it's it's what, what's the payoff is that you know when you find amazing performances it's like there's nothing like it you know they're better yeah. actors than than any um, grown-up because they're so natural and um, you know they don't have any of these uh, tricks that uh, their grown-up actors develop so what I what, what the trick is is that you um, you actually when you're auditioning you search for the kid who resembles the character the most in personality so you never try and get a kid to pretend they're someone else. You find the Ricky Baker, you find the Ricky Bakers of the world and you choose the one that, you know, is closest to what you want in the film. And then, basically then, all they have to do is remember the lines and so say the lines because yeah. they're basically being themselves and saying the lines. And if they know what the lines mean and they're being truthful, then it's done. Yeah, you've got, it, it's, it actually takes all the pressure off when you find the right kid. It's eighty percent of the of the work is finding the kid. Yeah. So what you're saying is Julian Dennison's a bad egg. He's uh yeah well see this thing about Ricky Baker he's not a bad egg. He's actually a really sensitive lovely kid <laughs> who is pretending to be something that, that he's not. Um, yeah you know and I think there's there's probably elements of um, of that character within Julian for sure especially like the loving caring and the sensitive natured um, yeah. parts and you know. The parts that you know, who, who, the part of the kid who loves reading books and um, loves making up poetry and loves dancing. Like that's all. That's all, Julian. And of course, he carries the film. So I, I assume if he's around you, he just carries the conversation as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's very confident. And he's very relaxed, and that's what makes it relaxes everyone else on set as well. And mm -hmm. you know, and for me as a director, it's like being around actors who are relaxed and who are having fun, and you know, like not. not they don't create stress, which is yeah. um, you know, how I avoid stress. It's like being around people like that. It must have also been um, also stress relieving to have Uncle Sam Neill 
yeah. on board, just um, really aiding well, that duo act. Yeah, 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 that's right. And it's, they're, they're such a great odd couple, but they get on so well, and they're so, you know, they're good friends now. And um, you know, just together on screen, they just look so funny. And 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 and, and again, like, you know, having an actor who's had who's got so much um, experience, and he's been, you know, he's, I've grown up watching him in so many different things. And I remember like um, seeing a clip from Dead Calm and realizing just how young he was in that film. And um, you know, he's been around, he's done everything. And to have that confidence on set, and to have someone who's like who's seen it all. Yeah. You know, and I don't, you know, I, I, it's not like I ever really had to sit down and have deep conversations about his motivation or where his character's coming <laughs> from. It's like, he's done his own work, he knows. He's yeah. like, and that's, that, and I think that I started realizing, you know, that's why people get the very best actors and that's why people pay huge amounts of money for actors who will turn up and give you, what you exactly what you want really fast, you know, so you're not sitting around for two hours trying to get it right. I can't actually remember the last comedy that Sam Neill was in. Uh, I don't know. No, don't know. it's has he been in a comedy? If not, then thank you for putting him in one. I've always yeah. wanted to see that. Yeah, I mean, he, and 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 he's great. He's um, I think the thing that Sam often said, oh, my character's not very funny. He's like, oh, you know, everyone else gets all the jokes, but his character is funny because he has no joke. I mean, his <laughs> character's hilarious because he's working it out the entire way. Like, you know, I think a lot of those scenes were. Reese is like going on and, and improvising and like sometimes you see Sam just trying to looking around the room trying to work out what's going on and that stuff's hilarious because it's really what the character would be like. Yeah it often provides a base and that's why a lot of comedy needs that straight man. Yeah you do need that and you know and it's just one of those things you can just embrace it and so you know like that is the character that everyone latches on to because it's the most he's the most grounded character and he's the one that sort of is you know really the anchor in the yeah. film. Now, this is played overseas um, to various countries. Did international audiences laugh in the way you expected, say, a New Zealand audience to laugh? Because the humour is mm. primarily New Zealand based. It's a very New Zealand humour in this film, but I was very surprised, pleasantly su surprised in, um, in Sundance when um, the first two screenings we had to, um, I think, like 1,400 people. I mean, you actually missed a few jokes because the audience kept laughing through them and you know we couldn't hear the you know the next joke and stuff. Yeah. so like it's like it, it was amazing because the um yeah the response was way way bigger than i had anticipated and they really did get the humor um there were a few like really new zealand specific uh jokes or terms or things that people say that you know obviously they didn't quite get but there's so many you know so many opportunities for a laugh and so many different little things to think about throughout the film that it's, so, it's okay if they don't know what a Hilux is, you know, it's okay if they don't, yeah, it's, um, they just forget about that and you know, the next thing pops up. But um, it was great. It, it meant, you know, for me, it was like if an American audience can laugh this much in the film, then, you know, I can't wait for an, a New Zealand audience to, to watch it. Absolutely. Now, in your opinion, when does a film fail at humour? If you think you can pinpoint it. Uh, I don't know. So everyone has different opinions on what's funny, and for me, like, um, I feel like when it's trying too hard to be, maybe it's you know it's I don't know when it's when when people are trying too hard to be funny, like when actors are trying too hard to be funny, or or when the filmmaker when you feel like oh the filmmaker really wants me to laugh here. If you ever feel watching a film and you get that feeling like oh they want me to laugh. That's when I kind of, I get, I, I break out of the film and, and start thinking about it and thinking, I don't want to laugh. Like, I want to laugh because I think something's really, you know, that, that I'm in on the joke, not that, you know, that someone's kind of uh, playing with me. So, you know, I, and, and I think with a lot of really broad, broad comedies, I feel that, you know, like, the comedies that, that don't work for me are the ones with, like, um, really bad sound effects like whoosh <laughs> the, one that's, the ones that try to sort of mask a badly timed joke yeah it? yeah or like just like super ridiculous or like really kind of t sort of teenager-y humour mm. I guess kind of stuff that I would have found hilarious when I was like 13 yeah but I feel like 
I've grown out of that a bit. <laughs> I'll probably go back to that kind of stuff, but yeah, yeah I've grown out of it. Now there was, um, in the stuff interview, which was really good, uh, you mentioned how like a lot of people assume that to make something artistic, it has to be somewhat really depressing. Mm -hmm. And that kind of draws away from the fact that comedy is art when it's done really uh, well. Uh, yeah, absolutely, and I think, because it is art, and it's actually one of the hardest arts to perfect, and um, yeah, I still don't know why they give Oscars to, yeah, I mean, I know why they give Oscars to dramas, <laughs> do you, to dramatic acting. It's like, oh wow, they cried. Well, oh, they lost a lot of weight. Well, that's amazing acting. <laughs> but it's like, you know, being able to make people laugh and cry in the same film, I think that's a feat. And I think yeah. that, you know, being able to, and yeah, people just don't realize how hard it is to make a comedy. Like the editing a comedy is like one of the hardest things in the world. Yes, yeah. you know, and it takes forever. And often you feel, you know, you, you you come very close to throwing jokes out because you think they don't work, and then it's like you realize, oh, it's just you just add one more second to the end of it before the next line, and yeah. it, every, you know, it changes everything. And so there's a lot of trial and error, and it's like it becomes a real science. Um, and I feel like that's way harder. I'll never stop running. Yeah, and I'll never stop chasing you. I'm relentless. I'm like the Terminator. I'm more like Terminator than you. I said it first, you're more like Sarah Connor in, in the first movie too, before she could do chin-ups. We've accused ourselves a lot in the film industry of making too many weepy films in particular eras. Do you think that's the reason um, that, we, that we would create so many films? Because we believe that's what we need to make to be considered art? There are just, I think there are just trends. You know, like in the 80s, there were, I think, less of those weepy films and more of these crazy adventure films and more car chase films and things where, we, you know, films where we wanted to just blow things up. And um, and then I think, you know, especially when the resurgence of independent cinema came about in the early 90s, and then through, you know, all through the 90s it became all about, like, the serious, raw dramas, the gritty dramas, and then even in, into the 2000s. Um, and I just don't think I'm really, I mean, I'm sure I'm capable of making a film like that, but I just have no interest in turning up to work, trying to create, recreate the world's sadness. <laughs> I just feel like <laughs> I couldn't see enough of that on TV. We get the news. Yeah, we get the <laughs> we, news, which it's is enough. Like, exactly. And Donald Trump real. might become president, so that's the president. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, I, I, you know, I, um, I'm really happy doing what, what I do. Do you think, um, in terms of New Zealand film in general, there's, what are we not doing enough of, if you can think of anything? I think we're not um, pushing ourselves enough into, ter into more uncomfortable territories. Like, I mean, I think our comedy is getting stronger for sure, and I still don't know if we make enough comic features. But, um, but also by that same token, we don't make enough, um, I think we don't make enough like action films or, you know, or horrors or, um, you know, I think like, Genre-wise, we, um, you know, I think we still hold back a bit from from a lot of these, um, and we used to do that a lot. But I think, again, like when we kind of found our footing with, you know, the kind of the, through that era of like, um, you know, in my father's den and rain and, um, you know, any, and I mean, yeah, Whale Rider, which is an uplifting film, but you know, it's definitely still a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a heavy film, you know, yeah. so um, it's a drama, you know, I wouldn't say that Whale well, Rider's a comedy. <laughs> um, you know, all beautiful films, but um, but again, like, it's, you know, some of us have got to do some, some different stuff, otherwise we'll only be known for these for this dark cinema. You know, like yeah, Sam yeah. Neill said, oh, it's the cinema of the unease, but, um, you know, that's, uh, it's kind of true, but it doesn't have to be. <laughs> Of course, the other side of it is um, trying to figure out how to sell these alternative films as well. Like, uh, I think the best example in terms of uh, the horror genre, genre that we had, Deathgasm, that was a good film and lots of people loved it. Um, played really well at the film festival, however, it wasn't able to get a sort of a bigger release mm -hmm. in New Zealand. How do you think we could overcome that for other genres, if you have any idea? Um, I don't. The, I have a theory that um, that in times where 
the periods you know um, uh, of the where the economy is is suffering and people um, don't have a lot of money to spend, they don't want to go and see films about how tough life is for people. Right. You know because you know life is tough in real life, and then you've got to go spend fourteen, fifteen dollars and get a babysitter or you know like spend all this money like going to see a film just about how your life is tough <laughs> you know yeah. it's like it's who wants to be reminded of that you know i think the reason that um a lot of those especially those dramatic films aren't doing very well is because you know people want an escape which is why the superhero films are doing really well and why there's big escapism films why yeah. three-hour superhero films you know are making a lot of money because people want to escape from their lives for three hours and if they're going to spend fifteen or eighteen dollars doing that, they want they don't want to do it for like you know eighty five minutes. They want it to be a <laughs> long a long escape. Um, you know, I think some of those like Deathgasm and some of these um, other like real distinct genre films. Um, you know, I, I I'm a realist in terms of um, in terms of like how I know that like cast is like a big part of selling a film now and for a lot of those sorts of things people are either into a gimmick that's super original or they're into something the way that with a recognizable name mm -hmm. um, so you know the way that i've tried to approach my work is to make stuff that is entertaining and uplifting and funny which are three things i think that are, you know when there's a combination it doesn't necessarily mean you need to have big names and I'm lucky that I have Sam Neill in the film you know and so you know I'm trying to make films now that um, that a large audience can go and see and walk away feeling good and you know not in, in a cheesy way because I don't think it's cheesy to feel good after the yeah. end of a film I think you know it's good to go out with a smile on your face um, you know not every film has to be like that but we do need them um, you know and then go out and tell their friends go and see the film it's like fun and um, you know, when we were making what we do in the shadows I remember like often I would look around at what we were doing and just think this is this is really ridiculous this film <laughs> and I don't know if anyone's gonna see it um, and one of the sad things about you know bring the film out and in, in, um, not sad but like the unfortunate things was that it got an R13 rating so it meant like people couldn't take their kids to it, and you know, young people audiences, young audiences couldn't go, and I think it didn't have as big a kind of stamp on you know New Zealand's cultural identity as it could have, um, just because of a stupid rating, and yeah. you know, and and so yeah, I made a real effort to make a film that kids could go and see, and old people could go and see, and it, like regardless of your age, you could go and see it and enjoy it. Yeah. And um, def you're definitely continuing that trend of making big audiences for the whole family can see because you're going to be making Thor. Yeah, um, uh, exactly. Yeah, and um, I was also just wondering about this. Are you going to pull a Lee Tamahori on this? Are we, are we not going to see you for like another 20 years and you come back and make a... Oh, uh, yeah, no, maybe. No, I think that... Um, I think that I'm different in that... I mean, look, who's to say that I don't just keep getting tempted by bigger and bigger things and... You know, talk to me in two years, but um, <laughs> if I take your call. But um, no, I th you know, like I do. I, like I've got three other films that are a lot smaller than this Thor film that um, I'm desperate to make, and they're you know, two of them are um, New Zealand films. Um, yeah. One of them is an international film, but yeah, there you know, there's you know, Jermaine and I are writing a sequel to Shadows that we're trying to do, and um, so there's definitely like, you know, there's a real good reason for me to. To come back and make those films, also because I can do them faster. Yeah. And for, you know, for two years of my life, and then after that, I'd want to do something that I can do within a year. So, yeah, for sure, for sure, I'm, I'll be coming home and, and working on on New Zealand stuff. That's good to hear. Yeah. Um, it's a lot easier for me to make stuff here, and I get complete creative control, <laughs> which is great. You know, which yeah, is, yeah. I don't get, I won't get anywhere else in the world. But absolutely. Like, you know, people trust me enough here that, to give me that. Cool. Because you also co-created the uh, Peaky Films Initiative as well. Yeah. Um, which is, you got a bunch of talented filmmakers in that hive. Would you feel comfortable with, say, creating a script, creating a story, and then passing it off to someone else to direct? Uh, yeah, I would. And um, I've actually, uh, I've, I've actually done that a little bit. I've done, um, I mean, I've definitely done writing on other people's projects. 
Um, I've now got a couple of um, ideas that I'm only just producing and just as a creative, you know, like I will give notes on the script and stuff, but I'm basically, it's, it's me being able to to be involved in multiple projects all at once without having to, the, you know, to put myself under the pressure of writing and directing and yeah, sometimes being in the same thing. Because there just, there literally is not, no time for me to do that. You know, there's, yeah, um, yeah we've um, sold Shadows to FX in the States. Oh, cool. And so they're gonna make a TV version of it. And uh, Jermaine's doing the pilot for that and I don't have any, uh, involvement because I'll be working on Thor and other than I'm a creative producer on it and I, you know so which is actually great though because I don't need to be on set con you know helping to control everything and you know yeah. it's actually quite liberating. Sorry I have to ask one more Thor question. Um, will Martin Campbell be in it? <laughs> um, Martin Campbell the director? Yes. I hadn't thought about it but you know what I could return the favour and ask him Please. to be an alien. I mean, I might be the only person who gets it, but <laughs> do it for me. That would yep, be great. Yep. <laughs> Why not? Go. Cool. Well, I'll remember that. So thank you, Taika. If it happens, if then it, you take credit. Yeah. Yes. Great. <laughs> you know, Alex, who did this? Tell them I was the water people. The water people?